welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of Learning Something with Steve. During the coronavirus lockdown, day six. Here we go. I'm actually going to load it. Oh, snap. 20 seconds. Like I'm looking into the past. Boom. Boom. People, go follow me. Yeah. Okay. So, last time I finished section one, section two, I'm on to section three. Section three. Hello everybody and welcome to knowing your topic and specification. Now, understanding your subject is key to being able to model it, draw it, or do whatever you want with it. Especially later on when we come to animating things, if you don't quite understand how something works or how it's really assembled, you can end up with something looking just a little bit odd. Planning your model. This is key. Knowing your scales, knowing how things are going to interact. That is key to making sure that your model acts in a way that's believable. And also knowing the importance of research. I will repeat this already, throughout already the course. That was from yesterday. So let's, let's go with this one. Hello everybody and welcome to this quick tip on the Blender model scale. And what do we mean by that? Well put simply, if this cube here represented a building, but we had everything set to millimeters, that would be bad. That would be the wrong scale to have set up. Meters would be much more appropriate. If we were making a, a an oil tanker, working in millimeters would be the wrong scale to use. Now I'm obviously interchanging here millimeters and meters. You can use inches and feet if you want. And we can do that over on the side panel here. So if we go to the properties panel and go down to the scene view. So we're setting the unit for the entire scene. That's important because you can have multiple scenes within Blender with different units. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the scene here. And we'll see that we've got an option here for units. If we click on that, it gives us... Okay, here we go. ...to the position of having an empty with an image. Here we go. Importing... Hello everybody and so welcome to combat. importing your reference material. By the end of this lecture you'll be able to import your pin, as you can see here, in a position where it's not only transparent, but you can see the objects behind it as well. Really useful for any reference material. Let's find out more. Okay, so as you've guessed it, there's more than one way that we're going to be able to do this. The first way that I'm going to show you is to simply go to your file manager, find your reference and drag and drop it in. This will generate an empty with our image attached to that empty. And we can move it around. We can move around in the scene and you notice that it's aligned with the view. So as soon as we've added that into the scene, it's aligned with the view itself. And that can cause problems because if you weren't expecting that or are not quite in the right view, you have to undo and go backwards and forwards again. But that's a really quick way of getting us to the position of having an empty with an image associated with it. I'm going to highlight that and delete it out of the way because the next way I'm going to show you is a bit more controlled. We're going to go to edit and preferences. And under your add-ons tab, so if you're not there, go on to the add-ons tab on the left-hand side and start typing in in the search box image. And you'll see an option here to import, export, import images as planes. Make sure you've got a tick in that box. And if you want it to happen every time you open up a brand new Blender file from now on, make sure you click on Save Preferences. Once you've done that, you can go ahead and close that down. Now what will happen is when you go ahead to add a new object into the scene, we've got this new image option. And we've got three options, reference, background, and images as planes. We'll start with images as planes. This is the one that it's, it seems to be indicating that we want straight away. And we can see we've got a load of options down here as to how it's going to import. Okay, I'm going to scroll down here. It's not apparent, by the way, that you can lift this up and down. This catches a lot of people out that you've got things hidden behind this invisible area. So I want to go to my bowling in the world and pins folder my pin reference which is what i downloaded okay so let me actually open up my downloads go to downloads yeah extract that cool so then i'm going to go to do -do. Um, downloads, not the right downloads, this downloads, not that downloads, 
go to downloads here. Yep. How do you date modify original pen reference? Import image displays. And oh snap. In the previous lecture, and we're going to open that up. Okay, where's it gone? Well, I'm going to go ahead and hide my cube. It's imported a plane with the right aspect ratio with a texture of that pin applied to it. So we won't see it until we're either in look dev mode, there we go, or we're in shaded mode. Now, of course, the issue with this is it's not very good as a reference image, but it is very good as maybe a background image if you wanted to put, say, some trees in the background of a scene that you're working on. Very similar to how we introduced just having a billboard in the back, a bright blue one or an orange one. If you cast your mind back to the first ever lectures that we did where we were, oh, we just want a blue sky. Well, let's just put a big blue thing behind the camera so we don't see anything else beyond it. This is how you can do that, but with an image. Let's have a look at the other options. So let's go ahead, delete that, and add in an image as background. And this time, if we go into the pin reference, we can see that it's added it in just as we had before. Just as if we let's go ahead, delete that, and add in an image as background. And this time, if we go into the pin reference, we can see that it's added it in just as we had before. Just as if we dropped it in. So we can see here that it's aligned perfectly with the view as it was. And then, of course, we can move around the scene. Now, it's got these grab handles that we can grab on. And you can see there, it locks to the aspect ratio of the object. So that's another way of getting to the same point that we were on before. However, the key one, the important one for us, is a reference. So once again, if we add in reference, it will align to your view. So that's the first thing to bear in mind. So before we do any of this, what we need to do is make sure we're on the right view. So either the right or the front orthographic projection. I'm going to go ahead and add in an image reference, and I'm going to go pin reference. Now with this here, okay, so we go on and reference, and then pin reference. I'm not going to worry about scaling at the moment, we'll talk about that later on, but for the moment we just need to make sure that we can see it and it's properly aligned with our mesh objects. So I'm going to bring back our cube. So the first thing you'll see here, A, we're in shaded mode, I'm going to go back to solid. We cannot see our image when there's an object in the way. It's just buried in between. So let's go round to the front. What can we do? Well, on the empties properties, if we scroll down on the object properties to where we've got our viewport display. If we open that up and scroll down, we've got a couple of options. The first one that you may find very useful is having it in front. Now that is incredibly useful as then we can see our image no matter where. But the problem there, of course, is, well, our, we can't see our object, which puts us in a bit of a conundrum. It's better if uh, this image was slightly transparent. Well, we can do that. If we go to our color options, not only can, only can we color this if we wanted to, so we'll set it back to normal, but at the bottom here, we have an A. Now we've got RGB, A, H, S, V, A, and a hex value here if you wanted. Um, the RGBs are green, blue. This is hue, saturation, and value. But the A stands for alpha on all of these. If we turn that down, our image becomes see-through, which means that we can see both the image and the object behind. And that's what we'll want to make sure that we have when it comes to actually doing anything with our image in Blender as a reference image. So there we go, multiple ways of importing an image into Blender. And now it's time for you to give that a go in the form of a challenge. Okay, so your challenge is to set your view to either the front or a side orthographic view. Once you've done that, import your pin reference image into Blender. Then set the image to be in front of everything else in the viewport and make sure your image is exactly 0.4 on the viewport's alpha channel. We may change this later, just want to make sure you're comfortable with actually tweaking one of those settings as well. Pause the video now and give that a go. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Let's go ahead and import our pin reference. Okay, so welcome back over into Blender. I'm going to press 1 on my number pad to whiz around to the front view. And I'm going to go Shift and A to add in. And because I made sure that I've saved my user preferences, I have these options every time I start. If you don't have those after creating a new Blender file or perhaps coming back to Blender later on, remember that in your preferences, if you don't save your preferences, it will only apply to the Blender file you're working on, which is sometimes beneficial. But at this point, we want it to apply to everything. It's a really useful one to have turned on. In fact, I'm going to make sure I close my user preferences down as well. 
Okay, so we're in the front view. I'm going to add in a reference image. I'm going to go and find. Fortunately, I've already bookmarked it, but it will also be in my recent as well. Remember this little hidden area here. Uh, bowling ball and pins. Uh, pin reference is the one that I want to import. Now, I have included this against this lecture as well, if you want to use exactly the same reference material that I have. Of course, I would always encourage you to use your own reference material so you can really tweak and so you're not just doing monkey see, monkey do work as we go forward. Okay, now that that's imported, I can scroll down here whilst I'm in my empty properties the object data properties I'm gonna to go to viewport display open that up and I'm going to say that it's in front of everything that's exactly what I want now the color I'm gonna to go to alpha and I'm just gonna type in 0.4 and there we go everything sorted it looks like it's probably a little large at the moment but we'll get so this is not doing what I wanted to do sorting that out in a bit okay there we go hope you found that pretty straightforward to do if you did struggle a little let us know where you struggled over in the discussions or of course if you found a different way of doing this i'd love to hear about it as well and i'll see you all in the next lecture Alpha. Oh, there we go. Boom. And we got that alpha right there. Okay. Okay, huh? got that. Hello everybody and welcome back. This is going to be a very quick lecture hopefully. Some of you guys have given me some feedback and I think it is wonderful. So I'm going to show you an alternative way now of importing reference material as well. Very similar to what we were doing before. However, we can actually specify the size and we can tweak some of the settings as well. So let's go ahead and do that. Hmm. With our default cube in front of us, we can just delete that and get it out of the way. We can then go in, and I'm not going to orientate my view just yet because I'll show you we can just change things later on as well. I'm going to go to add something in, so shift and A, and we're going to add in this reference material. Let's go and find our pin. Go to my bookmarks that I've already got here or recent. Remember, this is this side bit here. It's very tricky sometimes. It gets in the way and you can pull it down and suddenly everything's back there. I need my pin reference. If you're unsure, of course, you can click the thumbnails option at the very top here. We can see everything's going on. As you can see, this is Michael from the future. This is what we're going towards. Brilliant, isn't it? Okay, so let's open up the pin reference and we get it in the screen here. And if we scroll down these tabs on the left here and go to the one that looks like a picture. So it's the object data property. That image there does change. If you're working with a mesh object, it's different from if you're working with the camera or if you're working with a lamp, etc. So it's currently an image and we get lots of options here. So we can actually specify the size to be 0.38 if we wanted it to. And it's suddenly gotten a lot, lot smaller. There we go. So if we wanted that size, we could pop it in there. I can scroll down here and I can turn on use alpha. And then you can see through the image as well. And the other really cool thing here is you can change whether it's shown only in orthographic or in orthographic and perspective or only in perspective. So what we can do here is we can align this 
image with our view first of all. So if we go ahead and open up the property sidebar here and then go to the rotation settings, I'm going to zero them all out because I'm not sure which way we need to rotate it. It's going to be 90 degrees on the X axis and then we can have a look at it from the front. When we look at it from the front, we can just change this option here, display and perspective. So now when we move out of this, it will disappear, but it will be there whenever we're looking at it in front orthographic because that is the way that it is facing. So there are a couple of options there, very quick lecture I know, but to just go in and add this so it's the appropriate size. And you can see here because I've added in 0.38, the question is there of course, what size is that referring to? Well, okay, and the size thing, we can just check for real if it's the right size. At 0.38, I think this needs to be 1.9. 0.19, my mistake, there we go. That should sit exactly on the floor. Then we can go ahead and add in our reference cube again and set its dimensions to 0.38 on its height and lift it up to 0.19. I believe the dimensions here, I think we said 0.12, 12, 12 centimeters. In fact, we can type 12 centimeters. Remember, you can do that. And now I think you'll find that if we go into wireframe, Yes, perfect. So there you go. There's another way of adjusting your reference material to the same size. Now you'll find that both this and the one taught in the last lecture will be useful in different circumstances. Hope you've enjoyed this quick tip on your reference material and I'll see you all in the next lecture. Hello everybody and welcome. In this lecture we are going to do a couple of things. The first thing is create a placeholder for our image so we can scale our image appropriately. Once we've done that you can also see over on the side here we've made a note that we can refer to all the time rather than having to hop in and out of Blender to another place. So let's go find out more. Okay, so this is where we left off before. And what we need to do is make sure that we've got something to actually squash this reference image into so it actually is the right size. So we can start using it as proper reference material. Now, arguably, at this point in time, you could just leave it as it is and then scale everything at the very end. But I like doing things this way around, so that's the way we're doing it today. So the first thing I'm going to do is use my cube. I'm going to rename my cube to placeholder. And the whole point of this is it's going to represent our pin in its simplest possible form. In fact, it's going to be a bounding box to make sure that our pin ends up the right size. Now, first of all, this cube is two meters by two meters by two meters, and that's the wrong size. We need it the right size. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in my notes that I've got from elsewhere. So I'm going to change my editor type in the outliner. It doesn't matter where you do this. You could do it elsewhere. You could create a new window if you wanted to. In this case, I'm just going to change it from the outliner to a text editor. And you can see that the shortcut keys there, Shift F11 if I wanted to. And it will change it to a text editor. Now I'm going to scroll along here and click New. Now this is a good tip for you if for some reason you are working in the text window or any other window and you can't see part of the header, you can use your scroll wheel to go backwards and forwards as well as of course making the whole window larger and smaller. I'm just going to scroll along here and press New. It's going to create a new bit of text. I can name that text file like any other object in Blender. I can name it Pin Specs or something along those lines. Now, with my cursor in here, I can start typing. If you move your cursor elsewhere, it will stop typing in the text box. Now, I've already got in my paste buffer the actual specs of our pins. Now, what we can do is use this and go back and forwards to this whenever I need any reference material. what we can do is use this and go back and forwards to this whenever I need any reference material or that within Blender, any text information. Now this is also useful if you need to make notes about your models. You can store them within Blender themselves so you don't have to refer to external files all the time. That can be very confusing. One thing that you may have to do is if you have a look here, there are a couple of different options. It's got formatting of numbers and text, etc. That's good if you're doing some coding within Blender. As you can see here, our text just... Hmm? What, Star Wars? Okay. <laughs>
What? I don't know. Oh, oh. <laughs> With the <a> mantis? <laughs> Before, for what you call it, screwed everything up. People must stay home. Hey, stay home. Cough on somebody. Keeps on going. So this middle one here will automatically wrap the text along, which is pretty useful. I'm just going to save my file as I am at the moment so I know that we're ready to work. Okay, so we've got all of our information in. Um, we need to adjust this cube so it's the correct size. And I'm going to do a couple of things here. And this is hopefully going to show you you can do things various ways when it comes to these fields within Blender. So if this transform window is not here, you need to make sure you're over the 3D editor window and press the N key. If you do that, this properties window will come up. And I've also got my cube selected. Not the empty, but the cube itself. You'll notice that these have different things within them. depending on what type of object is selected. Most notably is dimensions when it comes to a mesh object. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to these dimensions and actually type in what we need. So it's going to be 380 millimeters tall. Remember, I'm working in metric. If you're working in imperial, you'll need to use the inches. So I'm going to go to my Z, which is the vertical component of our model, and type in 380 millimeters. So even though that I'm working in meters, I can still type millimeters in here, and it will auto format. And we've got 121 wide. So mm -hmm. I can go into here and go one, two, one millimeters and that's worked now you may notice that the scale has changed so that's something that we will need to apply go control and a and apply the scale now the next thing that you may notice is that this is not sat on where z equals zero there are a couple of ways that we could go around sorting that out the easiest way at the moment is just thinking that the middle where the origin of our object is is halfway up the total height and we've already got the total height over here so i'm going to copy that information highlighting it go Control c go to its location and paste that in but then go divided by two and if you do that you can do mathematical calculations inside these fields that is really useful so if you're not quite sure what um, one number take another actually is you don't have to go outside of blender you can literally type the equation or the maths into any of these fields and it's not just simple addition multiplication you can also you use hurt trigonometry etc i say and not get to that later on in the course okay so now we've got our a placeholder object in the correct place and it's the correct scale it's just a matter of tweaking our outer object in this case our pin to the appropriate size and yes that's going to be your challenge okay so your challenge pretty straightforward is to set your reference image to the right size at the moment it's probably far too large and remember you can use pivot points to help you with where things are scaling so pause the video now and give that a go okay pause this now and give it a go Okay, everybody, welcome back. Let's go and set our reference image to the correct size. Okay, so you, like me, might have a reference image that's too small, or in this case, too large. I'm going to just scale this down to begin with to uh, some sort of scale, so it's roughly right. Okay, that's looking good. Now, the origin of this is going to be, once everything's in the correct location, at the same place as the other one, which was 0.19. I remember that. So there we go. So that's everything set there, and then I'm just going to scale this down until, hopefully, it fits into the right place. Boom. 
that's pretty much close together. So that's one way of going about this. Now I'm going to just undo everything I've done and just approach it in a different way. So another way that you might approach this is setting your pivot point to the 3D cursor so we can scale in towards it, which is fine. But as you start getting um, closer and closer, what we then can do is go GZ, lift this up so that it's sitting roughly on the floor because we are dealing with roughly and bit points to so now i'm going to just undo everything i've done and just approach it in a different way so another way that you might approach this is setting your pivot point to the 3d cursor so we can scale in towards it which is fine but as you start getting um, closer and closer what we then can do is go gz lift this up so that it's sitting roughly on the floor because we are dealing with roughly and to be quite honest if you've had to zoom in this close to adjust something then you've probably gone over the top so class me as going in and over the top there we go so now that it's on the bottom that we're scaling it to we can then just Yo. scale it back down and How's it roughly going? fit it into the right place again you can come in and you can tweak it but to be quite honest that's pretty much spot on that's exactly what i want now you may notice here as you've done this and you're now aligning it to a real world object the center of our object is a bit off so perhaps we need to rotate it ever so slightly around as well because it's not center aligned you can see that at the top here it's definitely lent over to one side uh, off it goes okay so you can definitely align that much better than how it was before and this is something you've got to bear in mind sometimes your reference material will be slightly wonky is that fine yes of course it is because it's just reference material we're not going to copy this exactly we're going to use it as a basis for everything else that we're doing okay so i'm going to save my work there brilliant that's all aligned and ready to work with we can start playing with curves and that will be over in the next lecture Hello everybody and welcome to this lecture on Bezier Curves. It's the first time we've played with curves so we'll take it slow but by the end of this lecture we'll be able to make an outline of our pin as you can see here and if I turn on our empty we can see it perfectly traces the outline of our reference image. Let's go over into Blender and find out more. Okay, so we left off here before with our reference material. The first thing that I'm going to do is add in a Bezier curve and I'm also just going to turn off my uh, text input at the top here. So I'm going to change it back to my outliner so I can use that there. And I noticed that obviously I was using a text field down here and now we have something in it. I'm going to reveal the header once more. I'm just going to get rid of any text that's in there. And then I'm going to right click header and toggle the header off once more. Then you can see my keystrokes nice and easy. I will turn them back on. Right, so we've got our, everything set up here and we're ready to work. The first thing I'm going to do is just hide the placeholder. We don't need it at the moment. What we do need is the image so we can trace. Now I'm going to go ahead and go Shift and A and add in a curve object. Now this curve object, we've got a series of options that we could pick. I'm going to pick Bezier. And you might go, well, there's an orange line that's appeared at the bottom. What's going on? Well, if we zoom out, we see that a Bezier curve has indeed been added. And if we press Tab whilst that's selected, we can see what a Bezier curve consists of. It consists of, in this case, a start and end point for the curve. And these are both vertices. And then you've got these handles. And if you select a handle, I'm going to press G here to move it, we can adjust the shape of the curve pretty easily. Okay, so there's the simplistic view of a curve. And we can go down here, grab the other handle, lift that up, and change the curve accordingly. So there are many, many options, and curves will get into some more detail about them later in the course. But that is the fundamentals of a curve. You have vertices and then handles, which control how the curve flows now we do have curve options as well if we go over to the properties view and scroll down until you find the one that looks like a curve you can change the amount of steps within that curve by changing the resolution preview and if we turn that up really 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 high to 64 we get a super smooth curve but if we then converted that to geometry later on we'd end up with a very dense mesh i'm going to leave it at 12 as the default and you will notice as we start tracing around the outline of our pin sometimes we might need more or less depending on how we're going so we just pick an average number that we can work out later on now one of the first things that we'll see here is that our curve is at the wrong orientation to our object in fact instead of trying to faff around getting this to actually fit the right way round, i'm going to delete it so i'm going to press a to select everything to do with that curve Whilst in edit mode, we're not in object mode, the reason why we're doing this whilst we're in edit mode is it removes all the curve data, and we're going to remove all the vertices. So we still, if we have a look in the outliner, we still have a Bezier curve object. Curve. Whilst in edit mode, we're not in object mode, the reason why we're doing this whilst we're in edit mode is it removes all the curve data, and we're going to remove all the vertices. So we still, if we have a look in the outliner, we still have a Bezier curve object. That's the key here. 
we're still editing that object. It just has no curved data at the moment. Let's whiz round to the front view and zoom curve. Whilst in edit mode, we're not in object mode. The reason why we're doing this whilst we're in edit mode is it removes all the curved data. And we're going to remove all the vertices. So we still, if we have a look in the outliner, we still have a Bezier curve object. That's the key here. We're still editing that object. It just has no curved data at the moment. Let's whiz round to the front view and zoom in slightly so we can see what's going on. Now, let's go ahead on the tool shelf here. And if you don't have the tool shelf, you can bring it up with the T key, making sure, of course, your, th your cursor is within the 3D view itself. And I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom where it gives us an option to draw a curve. Now, I could literally, if I was a super artist, kind of draw a rough outline around here and then tweak things as we go. That wouldn't be a bad start at all. In fact, that is pretty close to what I'd want it to be anyway. So there you go. There's one option. If you're a super artist, you could just quickly sketch it in. Let's say we weren't such a super artist and we wanted a bit more fine control. I'm going to undo that and just click once. Now, the initial placement doesn't matter too much, but you can refine it over on this control point here, this vertex. We can actually align it where x equals 0. And then we know it's exact. Okay, so I am noticing that I need to go back to object mode. <laughs> Because, woo, 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 Um, where the mirror point is going to be later when we spin this around. And the Z, well, let's also make it zero. Why not? Now, the next option is extrude. And you can see here, we align it where X is too much, but you can refine it over on this control point here, this vertex. We can actually align it where X equals zero. And then we know it's exactly um, where the mirror point is going to be later when we spin this around. And the Z, well, let's also make it zero. Why not? Now, the next option is extrude. And you can see here, we, the shortcut key for it is E. So much as we've extruded mesh data before, you can also extrude when it comes to curves. That's really useful. If we press E, we can see we can move it and place it in a rough position that we want. And we can do the same again and again and again and again. And there we go. We're done. But the problem here is when we've done this type of extrusion, for some reason, it's decided to make our curve less curvy and more straight, which is one of the options. It's called a vector. It just goes from one point to another. So now that we've done these vector points, how can we make them a bit more curvy? Well, what we can do is we can press A to select all and press, you can see we can move it and place it in a rough one option. If you're a super artist, you could just quickly sketch it in. Let's say we weren't such a super artist and we wanted a bit more fine control. I'm going to undo that and just click once. Now, the initial placement doesn't matter too much, but you can refine it over on this control point here, this vertex. We can actually align it where X equals zero. And then we know it's exactly um, where the mirror point is going to be later when we spin this around. And the Z, well, let's also make it zero. Why not? Now, the next option is extrude. And you can see here, we, the shortcut key for it is E. So much as we've extruded mesh data before, you can also extrude when it comes to curves. That's really useful. If we press E, we can see we can move it and place it in a rough position that we want. And we can do the same again and again and again and again. And there we go. We're done. But the problem here is when we've done this type of extrusion, for some reason, it's decided to make our curve less curvy and more straight, which is one of the options. It's called a vector. It just goes from one point to another. So now that we've done these vector points, how can we make them a bit more curvy? Well, what we can do is we can press A to select all and press V. And what V will do is it will bring up the handle type. And you can also find that under the control points menu. If we're in this, we get the option to set the handle type back to automatic. This is what we're used to seeing. 
Now that we've got it there, it's just a matter of going in and tweaking. And one of the things that you may ask yourself is, do we need this many vertices and handles? Is this too much data? The answer may be yes, the answer may be no. I definitely know you cannot create this shape with just two vertices because you can't get this inversion going on here and it coming back round. Perhaps you can't make it with three. You think that you could come out maybe here, back in, and then round again. You might be able to get... And you can also find that under the control point. Go, we're done. But the problem here is when we've done this type of extrusion, for some reason, it's decided to make our curve less curvy and more straight, which is one of the options. It's called a vector. It just goes from one point to another. So now that we've done these vector points, how can we make them a bit more curvy? Well, what we can do is we can press A to select all and press V. And what V will do is it will bring up the handle type. And you can also find that under the control points menu. If we're in this, we get the option to set the handle type back to automatic. This is what we're used to seeing. Now that we've got it there, it's just a matter of going in and tweaking. And one of the things that you may ask yourself is, do we need this many vertices and handles? Is this too much data? The answer may be yes, the answer may be no. I definitely know you cannot create this shape with just two vertices because you can't get this inversion going on here and it coming back round. Perhaps you can't make it with three. You think that you could come out maybe here, back in, and then round again. You might be able to get the rough shape, but remember at the top here, what we really want is the curve coming to a complete horizontal. And the only way of doing that is, and I'm going to go back to selection mode so I can select this handle. And this handle and this control point really need to be at the same height. So I'm going to copy that value for the control point. You can tell the control point is, is highlighted, by the way, because both the handles are also highlighted. If you select just the handle, only that is highlighted. And I can paste that value in. That's the only way of making sure you get a truly flat top that it comes in and then would also go back down and round. And also X here, um, its value is fine. It's important, though, that the control point's X value is zero because that's where it stops. And we can do exactly the same down the bottom here. We can find, well, Z equals zero. That's that's all we need to worry about there is. And I'm going to go back to selection mode. Maybe no, I definitely know you cannot create this shape with just two vertices because you can't get this inversion going on here and it coming back round. Perhaps you can't make it with three. You think that you could come out maybe here, back in, and then round again. You might be able to get the rough shape. But remember, at the top here, what we really want is the curve coming to a complete horizontal. And the only way of doing that is, and I'm going to go back to selection mode so I can select this handle. And this handle and this control point really need to be at the same height. So I'm going to copy that value for the control point. You can tell the control point is, is highlighted, by the way, because both the handles are also highlighted. If you select just the handle, only that is highlighted. And I can paste that value in. That's the only way of making sure you get a truly flat top that it comes in and then would also go back down and round. And also X here. So why is it that I can't find the vertex for this? That's the control panel. But I want the vertex. points how can we make them a bit more curvy well what we can do is we can press a to select all and press v and what v will do is it will bring up the handle type and you can also find that under the control points menu if we're in this we get the option to set the handle type back to automatic this is what we're used to seeing now that we've got it there it's just a matter of going in and tweaking and one of the things that you may ask yourself is do we need this many vertices and handles is this too much data this shape with this inversion three you what we really want is the curve coming to a complete horizontal and the only way of doing that is and i'm going to go back to selection mode so i can select this handle and this handle and this control point really need to be at the same height so i'm going to copy that value for the control point you can tell the control point is is highlighted by the way because both the handles are also highlighted if you select just the handle only that is highlighted and i can paste that value in that's the only way of making sure you get a truly flat top that it comes in and then would also go back down and round. And also X here, um, its value is fine. It's important though that the control points X value is zero because that's where it stops. And we can do exactly... 
Okay, so. the handle only that is highlighted and I can paste that value in that's the only way of making sure you get a truly flat top that it comes in and then would also okay so looking at this make sure this is zero oh what huh? shooting? oh because it fell off of a fell off of a Fill off or something. So go back down and round and also x here um its value is fine it's important though that the control points x value is zero because that's where it stops and we can do exactly the same down the bottom here we can find well z equals zero that's that's all we need to worry about there so z equals zero and you may notice here we've got global and local so the other thing that we could do oh, let's whiz round to the top here the other thing that we could do here is select our control point and make sure that says 0.38 and there we go now as we go through we can click and just press G, adjust, and make sure that line is flowing round and down as you'd expect it to. Now, if you have lots of control points down your model, you will find that you probably need far less a resolution. So if we have that at six, you can see that even though it's more stepped, there are more control points in between because this is going to be six steps in between each control point. And as we whiz around here, we can see that our curve is going round and down our object. We can see in 3D space, it's going woo, all the way down to the bottom there. And that's important. One of the things that you can end up with, and it's worthwhile checking, is that you have no tilt as you go down. You shouldn't do, providing that you've set up your curve in an orthographic and looking directly at your object. If for some reason you were slightly twisted and you started adding curve data in, there's a good chance that you've either got a tilt to it or it's not laying where y in this case equals zero. Now, if you happen to have created it from the side, you'll find that maybe x will equal zero all the time. But what we should find is that every one of these handles and control points in this particular exercise, um, with it sitting along the x plane, the image along this x plane, we should find that y is equal to zero. If for some reason you've made it round this way, you'd expect x to be equal to zero throughout. But there we go, that's all set up. Apart from the fact we need to make it just a little bit neater and see if we can get away with fewer of these control points. Obviously the fewer you have, the less control you have, but you may end up with a much better shape because you're able to control it better having fewer. It's an odd one to try and convey, but when you have this many control points, or even more, it becomes difficult to adjust the overall shape. And remember, we're not going for an exact copy around the outside of our pin at the moment. We're just looking for a good trace around. And that leads us nicely onto your challenge. Okay, so your challenge, finish off your Bezier curve. Now, one question, more or less control points? I'll leave that up to you to decide. It does depend on any nuances of the shape you want to convey and how detailed you want it overall. I'd like you to adjust your handles to correct the overall shape. Remember, we're just trying to trace the outline of our pin. And also remember, it's only one half that we're worried about because we are going to rotate that profile 360 degrees to create our pin. And I'd also like you to think about adjusting your curves resolution so that you have an appropriate level of curve detail. Now I know you're new to this, so what an appropriate level happens to be will vary. But basically, if you're looking at your curve and it looks like a series of jagged straight lines, you probably need to increase it. But increase it until it looks like a curve, rather than just whacking the number up as high as you can. That in itself will cause you problems in future. If you just whack a number up as high as it can possibly go, you will find Blender will crash or either lock up for a very long time. Been there plenty of times. Anyway, go ahead, pause the video and give that a go. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Let's go ahead now and finish.
finish off the Bezier curve. Okay, so I'm just looking at how this is going around the model. We definitely need one at the top and one at the bottom. I'm not sure we need this one here. I do think we need this one here. Uh, basically, you always want a control point at the peak of a curve. And because this is the top part of this curve, we're going to need one there. And this, where it turns around here, we're going to need one there. And we're going to need one here. That's that's for certain. I don't th I'm going to try deleting it and just seeing if we can adjust this handle to compensate. Ooh, roughly. And th this is what you always run into. I mean, at this point, you need to increase the curve resolution as well. But we're, we're really playing here. We're trying to get a shape. We're, and it's really forcing it into something it doesn't really feel like going into. I'm deleting it and just seeing if we can adjust this handle to compensate. Ooh, roughly. And th this is what you always run into. I mean, at this point, you need to increase the curve resolution as well. But we're, we're really playing here. We're trying to get a shape. We're, and it's really forcing it into something it doesn't really feel like going into. That feels much more appropriate in the level... of detail we've got and of course we can just tab out and see the overall shape so here if i grab this handle and just move it around slightly it follows the shape really well it looks good here comes in a bit too tight here what can we do well what the first thing we can do here is just adjust this handle and now remember when you adjust one handle it will adjust the other ones as well in fact this control point's really in the wrong place it really needs to be where it tucks in so i'm going to come out and have another look looks good to me and where it bulbs out here i'm just going to move this one up okay perfect now much like um, this top one and bottom one, I was saying that they should really sit so that the control point and the handle are level with one another. I think that r that rings quite true in other places like here. So I think that the X coordinate of the handle and the uh, control point itself should match. So I'm going to copy that and paste it into the handle because they are slightly different. Now that is only a very, very minor tweak. Um, is it important? Probably not. But I'm going to keep it like that. And I like the way that it's curving around. Now the bottom here. Later on in this section, we're going to make sure that our pin can sit on the ground flat. It's going to be nearly impossible to actually get this to be flat, so we won't worry too much about it. So what I'll do here is I'll go G and X. So I'm only moving the handle along the X axis along there, and then we can come out. And I think that matches it as close as oh, I really care oh, to make okay. it. Any more time spent this is on this is probably not going to work out now there will be some exceptions to this if you were trying to model something that you were going to 3d print and it was really important that it was accurate then yes spend more time on it and make sure it is accurate um, but in this case that's as close as it needs to be so i'm going to call that complete i'm going to call my bezier curve pin profile oh got caps lock turned on and it is important to get into the habit of naming things as you're going so pin profile is absolutely fine placeholder light empty so here we go, here's one that we've missed earlier. So this is not really an empty, is it? It's our pin reference. And of course, you can shorten that to pin ref or something along those lines. And here I'm going to also append this with pin. And the reason for having a pin placeholder and a pin profile and a pin reference is so that later on, if we add other things to this scene, which we very well might or may not do, um, well, at least then you can differentiate between the objects themselves. Because in this case, they're all prefixed with the name of the objects. Okay, so that's me done. How are you guys getting on? Please share your work over in the discussions. And I'll see you all in the next lecture. Okay, that makes things so much easier. Oh my gosh. Skip that quiz.
Hello everybody and welcome to this lecture where we're going to learn about converting object data types. So at the moment we have our curve that goes around our pin that we've got. If I turn off the pin reference, I'm just going to hide it by clicking on the eye, we see that we've got our outline. But if you were very carefully looking at the outliner over here on the right, you'll see that not only do we have a pin profile that is a curve, but we also have a mesh pin profile. And if I toggle those on and off, you see, if I just deselect everything there, that they are both one and the same which is really useful. We've now got two types of data that are identical to one another. And the important thing is there, we can do different types of operations depending on what the data type originally was. So let's go find out some more. Okay, so let's start off here by selecting our pin profile. I'm gonna hide my pin reference for the moment. And oh, as I'm zooming in here, you can see I've run out of zoom. I'm actually trying to zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. I just can't zoom in any further. So I'm gonna select my object and then go to view and frame selected. Now that's number pad full stop. I probably mentioned this in the past, but so useful I did want to mention it again. And when you do that, it basically centers the view around whatever object you have selected, and then the zoom will work so much better than it did before. Okay, so now that we have this object selected, it's a curve object. We do need to be in object mode, we're not editing it, but what we do need to do is go to the object menu and go down to where it says convert. Now I believe this used to have a basically centers the view around whatever object this in the past, but so useful I did want to mention it again. And when you do that, it basically centers the view around whatever object you have selected, and then the zoom will work so much better than it did before. Okay, so now that we have this object selected, it's a curve object. We do need to be in object mode, we're not editing it, but what we do need to do is go to the object menu and go down to where it says convert. Now I believe this used to have a really convoluted, I think it was control, shift, alt and C to convert, but that doesn't exist at the moment. And we've got two options here. We convert to a curve from a mesh or a text object, or we can convert to a mesh from a curve, a meta, surface or a text object. And this is really useful. It shows here that you can convert more when we're going to a mesh object then you can go into a curve and since we're going to be going from a curve to a mesh object that also means potentially we can convert it back later on but i'll show you a way that we can mitigate that just in case you lose some of the information so we want to convert to a mesh so we go ahead and click that now before we do anything else we don't want to lose the operator panel because i want to show you a couple of things so let's open up the operator panel and it doesn't have much on here of course it's got our two options that we had previously but this one here keep original now at the moment it's taken that curve object and converted it to a mesh object, essentially deleting the curve object from existence. However, this keep original, if I put a tick in it, we can see in the outliner, it will keep an original copy of the curve that was there. And that's really important because the curve may contain information that we don't want to lose. Now you don't have to do that. It's just recommended at this point whilst you're learning, hold on to the original curve data, unless you're absolutely sure, right, I'm done with that, let's bin it. I'm gonna keep it there so I can refer to it later. That's gonna be really, really useful. Now, I'm going to hide that out of the way. I'm not interested in seeing the curve data anymore. I just want my mesh object. And now I can confirm it's a mesh object because when I go into edit mode, we have our standard editing tools for a mesh object. So we can select everything here and we can extrude out or do other things with it. So that's one way of profile modeling a surface, something um, like an architrave or a skirting board along the floor. You could do it in this very way if you wanted to, especially with those really ornate ones. Okay, so now we covered converting. It's time for your challenge. Okay, so a nice and straightforward challenge for you. Convert your pin profile to a mesh object. And please remember to keep the original curve object as well in this case. Pause the video now and give that a go. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Let's go ahead and convert our pin curve to a mesh object. Okay, okay. everybody, welcome back. So I'm going to hide everything from my scene that I need just to keep things lovely and clean. I'm going to select my pin profile. I'm going to use the outliner to select things. And then I'm going to go to object and convert it to a mesh. I'm going to remember to come in here and keep the original. Now, what the original means, if we're keeping it, um, let's say we wanted to create a couple of different pins. Well, having the original there to refer back to is much, much better than having to modify mesh data. You've seen how easy it is to tweak the shape just by just pulling those handles about. And that gives us the option to do that. However, I don't want to see it. I just want it out of the way. Now, I'm going to open up the object data properties. We've got pin profile and pin profile 001. I want to call this pin profile curve. I want to be explicit as to what it is. Obviously, we can see it there. So perhaps curve isn't the right one. Perhaps original would be a better name. Now, it's absolutely fine if you go through and you find yourself renaming things as you progress through the course. That's fine. It gets it neat and in your head as to what is going on. So this is the original. This is the derived one, the mesh data that we've got from it. I want that one selected, and I only want that in my viewport so it's nice and simple. Brilliant. 
Excellent. So that's all done and ready to go. And it won't be long now before we start actually seeing our pin. Absolutely fine if you go through and you find yourself renaming things as you progress through the course. That's fine. It gets it neat and in your head as to what is going on. So this is the original. This is the derived one, the mesh data that we've got from it. I want that one selected and I only want that in my viewport so it's nice and simple. Brilliant. Excellent. So that's all done and ready to go. And it won't be long now before we start actually seeing our pin coming to life. And that will be over in the next lecture. See you there. Hello everybody and welcome. In this lecture we're going to have some fun and actually create oh, our pin snap. that you can see in front of us here. It's very... I need to get... Very straightforward to do so let's dive in and find out more hello everybody and welcome so the first thing we need to do here is go into edit mode on our newly formed mesh object so i'm going to tab over into edit mode now that i've done that i'm going to select everything because i'm going to do this operation on everything a couple of common sense checks here that we need to make sure first of all we need to just check that this is in fact where x equals zero which it is and this one down at the bottom, this vertex down at the bottom, is also where x equals zero. Brilliant. That is important because what we're about to do is we're about to use a function called spin. And it does matter where your object is in relation to the object's origin. So if we just tab out back into object mode here, we see that the origin is currently smack bang down at the center. That's this orange dot. If we go and go tab back into edit mode and do our spin operation but for some reason you've managed to make let's say the pin over here you weren't quite sure where you were you've been moving things around if you do the spin from here it will look odd and i'll show you what i mean right away so let's scroll down and get to our spin if i go ahead and click that we get these two blue pluses on the screen. If I start doing that, you'll notice that, look at that, it doesn't look like a pin at all. And you'll be asking over in the Q&As, Mike, mine doesn't look like a pin, what's going on? The reason why it doesn't look like a pin is because we're rotating, our rotational symmetry is based around the object's origin and the way that we're rotating it around on the z-axis here. So that's very important. And the same if it was off at some funny angle, you'd end up with some awesome looking shapes, but it might not be the one that you wanted it to be. So what do we do if that is the case? Well, hopefully it isn't, but if it is, what you can do is look at it from the side and we can do a best guess. So in this case, the, um, I just need to undo the mess that I've caused there. Look at this from the front again and you'd select everything. You'd find your origin and you just move it as close as you can. And then once you've done that, what you can do is manually adjust this vertex at the bottom here. So I can go and find, um, oh, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> 
I'm just going to turn off spin and do the select mode again. So I'm actually selecting. So here's my vertex here. I can go in and manually adjust it so it's where x equals 0 and here at the top as well. So this is going to be slightly wider than it was before. But you know what? I don't mind. We can always patch these things later as well um, if necessary. Now, what I am going to do at this point is I do want mine to be pretty spot on. I, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I'm just going to open up where I left off before and just go back into edit mode. I know everything's set up because I, I kind of prepared for this, as you probably guessed. So let's go back in and have a look at the spin mode itself. I'm just going to do something, which will bring up the operator panel, and then show you our options. So we've got our angle. If I increase the angle, we start to get it coming around. So here, for instance, if I type in 180, we should get half a pin. And we do pretty awesome now we've got this option here called auto merge so if we went all the way around to 360 degrees what we should find is that these vertices that are now overlapping because of course there was that there were some there before unfortunately that's not the case at the moment i found that auto merge doesn't actually merge these vertices it just simply puts them in the same place and ensures that they're in the same place i found that i still need to go back afterwards select everything in my model and remove doubles now, steps, what does that do? Well, steps is like the resolution of our spin that we've done. So you, if you set that too high, if I go, oh, I might have just crashed Blender. I hope I haven't. So be careful if you click and drag that because you may find that, oh, there you go. <laughs> we've gone up to a 1,000. That's far, far, far too much geometry. Oh, wow, I can't even see the faces that's created. Um, so don't go that high. That's far too much. And, of course, if you had four, that would, well, it looks kind of cool, but that's not the shape that we're going for either. There's always a fine balance in making sure that your geometry has the right level of detail. And there'll be loads of things pulling you and pushing you towards being really realistic or perhaps you're making a model for a bowling game. And if you're doing that, you may have restrictions on how much geometry you can have. I've been playing about with this lots, and I think 16 is a good number, as low as 8 and as high as 32, and maybe somewhere in between, but I do like my multiples of 8, so I might even go for 24 in there, not 243, 24 as kind of a, a halfway house. I'm not sure. I like playing with these things and seeing what the output is. That's the crucial thing. And of course, it's no longer a pin profile, it's also a pin, so we've got a bit of renaming to do. Now, one of the things that you will notice is no matter what you do, let's say we set this quite low, let's say it's six steps, and we come out of it, and so we've now got our pin, it looks really good. What we can also do is right-click on it and go to Shade Smooth. So this opens up our context menu, gives us a load of shortcuts, common ones for what we're currently in, which is object mode, and one of the options is Shade Smooth. And that will take that faceted look and make it look smooth. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that if you look at it from certain angles, you can see that it's a hexagon, especially from the top. This is what's called occlusion. It's the outline of our shape from certain angles. So from this angle, it looks pretty fine until you get one of those top views, either slightly looking down, we start to get this really horrible edge to it. What we can also do is right click on it and go to Shade Smooth. So this opens up our context menu, gives us a load of shortcuts, common ones for what we're currently in, which is object mode, and one of the options is Shade Smooth. And that will take that faceted look and make it look smooth. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that if you look at it from certain angles, you can see that it's a hexagon, especially from the top. This is what's called occlusion. It's the outline of our shape from certain angles. So from this angle, it looks pretty fine until you get one of those top views, either slightly looking down, we start to get this really horrible edge to it. And that's where coming in and tweaking the amount of geometry that's on our pin comes into effect. So if six is obviously too low. Can we see it if there's eight? Can we see that if there's 16? At what point does it really not matter anymore? The other thing to bear in mind is if you're looking at your pin from this distance, well, that's completely different than if you're this close to your pin. So there's loads of things that play into this. And with that knowledge, it's time for your challenge. Okay, so your challenge is to use the spin tool to create your pin. Set your pin to have between 8 and 32 steps. Don't worry if you have to go back and just try out some different numbers of steps, depending on how it looks. And remember to check for duplicates and remove doubles if you do have them. Turn on smooth shading and sit back and admire your pin. And once you've done that, go and show it off over in the discussions. Pause the video now and give that a go. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Let's go ahead and create our pin. Okay, everybody, so let's start by, first of all, going into edit mode, selecting all. I'm going to go down to spin straight away. I'm going to start the spin. I think I'm going to go for 16 in total, in, in total number of steps there. Nice halfway house, and we're going to have 360. I'm going to have auto merge on and, well, hope that it works. It might, it might not. I'm just going to click away, and I'm going to press W to go back to selection mode. 
Now with everything um, all sorted, I'm going to press the A key, which is going to select all of my mesh data. And I'm going to go to the F3 to search. And there we go. Remove doubles was one of the last things I did. I can just type in doubles. That's a nice quick way of getting that up. And yes, remove 30 vertices. And it's probably 30 from the top to the bottom. So there we go. That's all sorted there. Let's come out into object mode. Nice quick way of getting that up. And yes, remove 30 vertices. vertices and it's probably 30 from the top to the bottom so there we go that's all sorted there let's come out into object mode right click and shade smooth okay let's look at this from the top i need to just focus back in again i'm going to save my work as well okay so from this range you can see that it's a little bit jagged around the top at 16 but to be quite honest i don't think i need any extra detailing in there i, I think that's enough i think any more at it would be a waste when i could use something called a subsurface division modifier to do that for me in fact at the moment this might be a little too high poly depending on what we wanted to do with it but anyway it's good for the moment let's stick with it uh let's rename it it's no longer a pin profile is it it's a bowling pin so i'm going to rename it appropriately there we go, bowling pin. That'll also shift it out of the way of these ones that were just called pin before. So now I have my bowling pin object. I'm going to have a look at it in look dev. Look at that, nice and shiny. Well, it's not shiny yet. It's kind of a bit meh, to be honest. And that's because it's got its default material on it. So there are a couple of things that I think we're going to do in the next couple of lectures. Well, I know we're going to do them. Uh, the pinstripes. No, they're not called pinstripes. Or the, or the the stripes that go across the top there. Pinstripes would be vertical. Would look pretty awesome. Um, so we've got the stripes to go across. And perhaps make it a lot shinier. I know looking at bowling pins, they often have, you know, when they're worn, they have scuffs and things on. But when they're new, they're pretty shiny. So we need to sort that out as well. That'll be in one of the future lectures. So I'm happy with that. I hope you're really happy with yours. I hope it's come together really well. And please do share your work over in the discussions. We've got something we can show off now. So go and show it off. And I'll see you all in the next lecture. Hello everybody and welcome back. In this lecture we're going to focus on the materials of our pin and start having a look at the various material properties so we can get it looking a bit more glossy. Let's hop in and find out more. Okay, so this is where we left ourselves off before. Let's go in and start playing with our materials. I'm going to just hide my properties panel and tool shelf so they're out of the way. Right, so first of all we need to go to our materials themselves. So making sure the bowling pin is selected, we're going to scroll down and find the materials tab. We see that there is no material on our pin yet, so I'm going to create a new material and call it pin. Now that it's called pin, I'm going to switch over to look dev mode. And remember, you can use the Z key as well to do that, and then the number two, or move your mouse to the appropriate location. And why we're using that rather than render is we don't really have an environment set up at the moment. So even if we were working in rendered mode, it wouldn't really show it off. What look dev does do is we have a look under the shading tab. It gives us a world that's going to light up our scene as if this pin was actually within that world itself and if we click on that we've got several other options and you will see that if we select that the lighting that's on our pin changes dramatically and that will be even more so when we have a look at the material and start playing around with the properties when it comes to rendered mode it's just going to look a bit dull at the moment it literally is living in a big gray void so let's not focus on the rendered mode just at the moment and that's true whether you're using EV or cycles at the moment so I'm going to switch back to look dev and I'm going to change my shading environment just a a light environment and then we can play around and see how it would look like in other environments as well now with the new pin material selected i'm going to scroll down and you've got a plethora of things that you can change with your material now the one i want to focus on is a nice straightforward and simple one we've got our base color which we've played with before and if we scroll down a little further we have something called roughness so the less rough something is, the more reflective it is. If it has a roughness of zero, that means it's fully reflective, which means it's going to reflect things in its environment. We can see here this pin itself is reflecting whatever's in this environment here. And we can see it looks like this is a living room. If we set it to this street view, at some point you'd see the house there it is there in our environment. That's pretty cool. It gives us a good idea of the overall form and shape and how reflections will look 
on our pin itself. Now, of course, it's not going to have quite this mirror finish, but if we turn that all the way up to one, that means that this is now 100% diffuse. Light will hit this object or anything with this material on it and get completely diffused. It will have no reflection to it. So I'm gonna set that back down to maybe 0.1 for the moment. So it's still reflective, but not, not quite a mirrored surface. And of course, you can turn that up or down depending on how you're feeling about it. Now what I have found is that the roughness is very sensitive low down. By the time you've reached sort of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, you've lost all sense of what is being reflected and what you're left with is the light itself. So it's worthwhile knowing that sort of the first third is really where you need to be when you're talking about reflections. Now I'm gonna turn that back down, as I say, to about 0.1 for the moment. Now, I want to make sure I've got my stripes on here as well. So there are a couple of things that we can do in order to make sure that it inherits the current settings of this material, because I don't want to have to go in and then scroll down and adjust the roughness. As far as I'm concerned, those two stripes are going to be the same reflectiveness or the same roughness as our base here. In order to do that, I'm going to scroll back up and add in a new material slot. So as we've experienced before, any object can have more than one material slot. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to browse my materials rather than creating a new one. I'm going to browse for the pin. So now we have two identical materials. If I was to change one, it would change the other. I'm going to click the number two that has appeared, the number of users that use this data. And by doing that, it will create one called pin 001 with all of the previous setup down here, which is really useful. And I can call that pin stripes now this is where i where i got pin stripes from wasn't it thinking about it's the stripes that are on the pin okay now i need to go through and change the base color and it's not going to be white anymore so it's going to be probably red okay let's put it to red and of course there's nothing there yet we need to go into edit mode on our pin and pick with face select a couple of areas that we want it to be on and then assign that Let's go and tab out back into object from, wasn't it? Thinking about it's the stripes that are on the pin. Okay, now I need to go through and change the base color and it's not gonna be white anymore. So it's gonna be probably red. Okay, let's put it to red. And of course there's nothing there yet. We need to go into edit mode on our pin and pick with face select a couple of areas that we want it to be on and then assign. and pick with face select a couple of areas that we want it to be on and then assign that let's go and tab out back into object mode and there we go we've pretty much got everything sorted but not quite if we have a look at the pin reference itself we see that oh i'm i'm hideously off at the moment when it comes to those um, actual stripes and i'm pretty sure that the geometry won't allow us to line those up perfectly of course that will be your challenge okay and your challenge is to give your pin two material slots one for the pin and one for the stripe. Then we'll need to edit some of the geometry because what I'd like you to do is align your geometry with your reference material so that you can assign the stripe material to the right place on your object. 
and then set your roughness values between 0.1 and 0.2. That's roughly the right ballpark we're looking at. Of course, you can pick your own stripe color, etc. That's entirely up to you. I'm probably going to stick with red as I go forward. Okay, pause the video now and give that a go. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Let's go ahead now and sort out our pin and actually bring it to life and make it look more like the reference material. Okay, so we're over in our pin. Right. I think I'm going to set a base material for this first and then come back for the stripes later. So let's go for a material, create it, call it a pin. I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to be literal here. I'm going to set the roughness to 0.15. That's smack bang in the middle of the suggested figures. And the surface color, not the subsurface, the base color. Here we go. I'm going to leave it set as this brighter sort of white color. I think that's a good starting point to be in. Okay. So that's all that set up. Now I'm going to faff around with the geometry itself and make sure that it's lined up. And I say faff about because it can quite easily turn into a bit of a faff. Let's see what it looks like. Ah, that bottom one's almost perfect. We just need to shift this section of geometry, uh, this bit here, down and we're sorted. Let's have a look up. Let's pan ourselves up. Um, no, that's that won't do. So we need to do a bit of fiddling around here to make that work. Let's go down to this one here. So I've used border select or box select to select everything there, but of course it won't have selected things on the other side. So that's something to watch out for when you're doing that. I'm going to press uh, Z and go into wireframe. Then when I do do that, we can see that it's got everything selected and I'm going to zoom out, show nothing else selected there. Okay, so what I can do there is not only just press the G key and move down, but I can press the G key twice. And what that will do is that it will slide. So we've used slide before, we talked about it in the previous section, and that is one of the great uses for it, because as you can see, it keeps the overall shape that we had before, rather than just moving the geometry up and down. Now this one here is a little bit more complex because I, I want to make sure my geometry is also evened out as well. So there's a couple of options that we've got here. In fact, I think what we could probably get away with is a dissolve as well. So I'm going to try that. I'm going to select this middle edge loop here by holding down Alt and selecting. Even though it's on vertex select, it knows what I want. I'm going to press X and dissolve edges. I'm then going to grab this top edge loop, press the G key twice and bring it down. And then I'm going to do the same on the bottom edge loop and bring it up. This is why edge loops and face loops are phenomenal. It's enabled us to edit this model effortlessly and bring the geometry back to where we want it to be. And that cannot be understated, the amount of time that will save you. And that's that's fundamentally why edge loops and face loops are really, really important. Now, I don't have a new material to assign to these new faces yet, so I'm going to go ahead and create that. And I'm going to create it by first creating the material slot, selecting the original material, and... It's grayed out. Why is it grayed out? Well, you may have remembered we've come across this before. If we tab out, we'll be able to make it a single user. And then I'm going to call it a pin stripe. Okay, perfect. I'm going to set that to an orangey red around there. Looking good. Now down to this one here. So I've used border select or box select to select everything there. But of course, it won't have selected things on the other side. So that's something to watch out for when you're doing that. I'm going to press Z and go into wireframe. Then when I do do that, we can see that it's got everything selected. And I'm going to zoom out, show nothing else selected there. Okay, so what I can do there is not only just press the G key and move down, but I can press the G key twice. And what that will do is that it will slide. So we've used slide before, we talked about it in the previous section, and that is one of the great uses for it, because as you can see, it keeps the overall shape that we had before, rather than just moving the geometry up and down. Now this one here is a little bit more complex, because I, I want to make sure my geometry is also evened out as well. So there's a couple of options that we've got here. In fact, I think what we could probably get away with is a dissolve as well. I'm going to try that. I'm going to select this middle edge loop here by holding down Alt and selecting. Even though it's on vertex select, it knows what I want. I'm going to press X and dissolve edges. I'm then going to grab this. got here in fact i think what we could probably get away with is a dissolve as well so i'm going to try that i'm going to select this middle edge loop here by holding down alt and selecting even though it's on vertex select it knows what i want i'm going to press x and dissolve edges i'm then going to grab this top edge loop press the g key twice and bring it down and then i'm going to do the same on the bottom edge loop
Okay, I'm back. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know about that. I was over here talking and nobody was even saying nothing. Dang. But no. And bring it up. This is why edge loops and face loops yeah. are phenomenal. So it's enabled us to edit this model effortlessly so and bring the geometry back to where we want it to be. And that cannot be understated, the amount of time that will save you. And that's that's fundamentally why edge loops and face loops are really, really important. Now, I don't have a new material to assign to these new faces yet, so I'm going to go ahead and create that. And I'm going to create it by first creating the material slot, selecting the original material, and it's grayed out. Why is it grayed out? Well, you may have remembered we've come across this before. If we tab out, we'll be able to make it a single user, and then I'm going to call it a pin stripe. Okay, perfect. I'm going to set that to an orangey red around there. Looking good. Now I can go back into edit mode and with face select, I'm going to hold down alt again and select this face loop here. I'm going to hold down shift and select the next face loop as well. Once that's done, making sure that pin stripe is the material slot that's selected, I should be able to assign. And then, all being well, I can come out and have a look at this in look dev mode because I've been in wireframe up until that point. I'm going to hit pin reference. I almost forgot I was actually in wireframe because the pin reference was there in the background. And look at that. Perfect. This is coming along really, really well. I hope yours are as well. Really looking forward to seeing how you've gone about creating your pin, what materials you have applied to it. Have you gone for a simple stripe like this? Or perhaps you put a checkered pattern along the bottom. You can assign yep, them so manually. Start to you can do stripes like I'm doing. It's entirely Ooh, up to you. I really so do encourage pretty. you to oh make this gosh. project your own. And not just follow along Can't with me, I but really that. take out the lessons That's that nice. you've learned and create your own bowling pin. Maybe even something unique itself. Looking forward to seeing your work over Ooh, in the discussions. And I'll so see you all shiny. in the next lecture uh, okay so thank you i uh feel free to look back at the stream it's uh getting close to that time i am always trying to at least spend an hour and a half learning blender and today i went from essentially this oh no went from this picture and that line, and this box, to this. So, uh, so it's pretty. It's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. I'm pretty pleased with that. And it's like I can uh, go through and viewport cameras. How do I? How do I change the view? Navigation, yes. Fly navigation. It's like... Look at that. I'll take this out of that. And man, it just looks so pretty. Oh my gosh, look at that. That's freaking wild. Oh dang, you got a two chord. Oh yeah, that that's a I would go on eBay or something like that. Well, you can't really do much right now. Uh if you're in America, there's like freaking lockdowns and stuff because of coronavirus. But dang, you know. I I just got I I just got a 2.8 and it, it it's really nice and I mean obviously I I made a this thing looks so freaking nice like with the reflections i it's crazy that like yeah you know christmas christmas try to get those deals uh you know good luck with that this is this is crazy so i'm going to save this as a day six learning 
day six learning, I made a freaking bowling pin. That's just so pretty. Oh man, that's pretty. But thank you, thank you for tuning in. Uh, hope to see, hope you guys hang out with me um, next week because I'm not doing anything on the weekends. So adios.